it. Meet our panellists this evening. Sitting there in the middle, free as a bird, Jane Rosengrave is a proud Yorta Yorta woman, disability advocate. She is widely respected for her fearless advocacy regarding violence against people with a disability. Please make her feel really welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Down there, smiling widely, is Astrid Edwards. She coordinates the Associate Degree of Professional Writing and Editing at RMIT. She serves on the board of Melbourne Writers' Festival and hosts the Garrett Writers on Writing. She's also a member of the Victorian Disability Advisory Council and a national advocate for MS Australia. Please make her very welcome. Thank you. I feel like I'm on perfect match or something where we've got three <laughs> contestants. Uh, and Jess Knight is a writer and a performer and you might know her from her performance of Mormon Girl in the 2019 Melbourne Fringe Festival. Uh, you see her work everywhere. Comedy Festival at some point soon. Please make Jess very welcome tonight as well. <laughs> I'm actually going to start with you, Jess, sitting right beside me. Your piece is called I Don't Need Them to See Through You. It is such a funny and smart look at your life growing up. Um, you use humour a lot in your writing. What, why, why did you think you chose to go in that direction? Ooh. Um, well, my therapist would call it my defence mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> and she also says that for some psychologists, they'd be like, oh, you shouldn't hide behind your humour, but my psychologist knows I need it for my work. And she's like, it works good for you. <laughs> so um, I just, I think I have my parents and my family to thank for that innate need to make light of stuff because, yeah, it's a defence mechanism, but also I just feel like I get more out of making people laugh than I do making people feel sorry for me. So, and I feel like because I am so conscious of not wanting people to feel sorry for me, I immediately feel like my sense of humour is the thing I want people to notice, not the other stuff. Yeah. So I use it to my advantage, um, I hope. Yeah. Well, yes, you do. So that's why. I mean, I can be vulnerable, but mm -hmm. even when I'm vulnerable, I'll probably be making a joke. My partner's like, we're having a fight. Why do you have to be funny? And it's like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, I asked Jess if I could read just a, uh, a paragraph from her piece. As we said, it's called, I don't need them to see through you, Jessica Knight. Hey, how blind are you really? I once ate pot puree from a bowl in a cafe because I thought it was mixed nuts. This is amuses the young man I'm talking to at 2 a.m. He's taken me home and I'm trying to explain how bad my eyes are. It is my wearing contacts phase. I am my own example of a post-glasses makeover. I'm attempting to figure out for the hundredth time how to take the contact lenses out of my eyes before getting busy with this person who has a pet rat in a cage in his bedroom. The person is cute and I think it's quite sweet that he has a pet rat. <laughs> it's so difficult to remove the contacts and it causes my drunken self so much stress that I start cry to cry a bit at the futility of love and human connection. This lubes up my eyes so that I have uh, one of the contacts finally pops out and into my hand. Mm -hmm. It works with the other one as well. Success. I put them away and turn to the young man sitting on the edge of his unmade bed. He's smiling at me. I wipe my tear-stained eyes, smudging my eyeliner. I smile back and pull my T-shirt up and off over my head. This is being 25. It's beautiful. Mm. And in that, I think um, it is interesting you say that you are vulnerable. There is such a beautiful vulnerability in that, such a truth in that experience of being at 25. The, the, the story that you've written in this book for us, it spans that age range. We've got you as a young person when you were four years old getting your first pair of glasses yep. and then again, of course, what we heard then at 25. What was it like for you to reflect on this uh, experience of disability through the perspective of age? Really good. Like, I don't think I could have written it um, at any other time because the thing with my eyesight, it was something that I've tried my whole life to kind of cover up. And so I was always trying to make up for it. And 
it, I got sick of doing that finally. And so I was able to see, I think with a lot of things, I'm never convinced or one way for, for always. My relationship with my disability and with myself in general is constantly evolving. So, and I feel that my eyesight and my relationship to that is a perfect way to illustrate how much I evolve and change with how I identify with aspects about myself that I can't change. But my perception of those things is what is constantly changing. Yeah. So I can say I'm fine with it one day and then another day I might let it get me down. So with the eye thing, I think what was good about writing about that was that it allowed me to actually think really hard about it and be like, yeah, I have had such a relationship with my eyesight that is so intense and personal. And reading the book, I read, I was so lucky to read other people's experiences that were so far removed from mine and it was good. I felt like I had a kinship with these people. Um, I'm interested to explore that further throughout the evening with all of you about the experience of reading so many diverse experiences of disability. I mean, for myself as well, I was punching the air and feeling such a connection, as you say, and kinship. I found your writing about your uh, wrestling with ableism and your ingrained ableism really interesting. What, what does your or did your ableism look like? Oh, it's still there. Um, let's see, how do I describe it? It's like all the bad parts of a really arrogant white boy punk band. <laughs> I didn't know where you were going to go, but that's an interesting way to go. You know, they're loud, they're obnoxious, and they're singing about all the ways no one's ever going to like me. That's what my, enable, my ableism looks like. Or they're yelling at me about how I... I'm just a pain and I'm a burden and it's not the outside world that's to blame, it's just me. That's what my ableism is. It's not them, Jess, it's you. That's, that's what it is. How, how much of a process it, has it been and does it continue to be to understand that, to well, isolate that and know it is ableism? I mean, it's weird knowing that it is that now because I never did know it because uh, I feel like we're gonna go on a tangent, but when you're raised in the country like I was and also raised in a religion like the Mormon church, the Mormon church is basically what you would call American exceptionalism on drugs. It's like all about like inner power and you're special because you were chosen by God and everything that is wrong with you, well in the pre-existence that's like heaven before you come down to earth, you made the decision to come down here and you were told all the things that were going to happen to you and you put your hand on and was like, yeah, I'm in on that. So when I was a little kid and all these horrible things were happening to me and I was in hospital, I would go to church with my family and I'd be told, oh no, Jessica, you know, God doesn't give you anything you can't handle and you should be grateful. There are worse people off than you. And also, you jumped for joy when God said you were going to come down to earth. So you knew what you were getting into. Obviously, they didn't say you knew what you were getting into, but that was the freaking crux of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know or have the articulation or the vocabulary because you don't when you're 10 and you're in hospital and people are coming to give you blessings and telling you they'll pray for you you don't have the articulation to be like you know what can I just be sad about this can I be pissed off and angry so I guess that's why I'm a punk now <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That will be the title of your book. That's why I'm a punk now. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a really interesting area that I just want to explore just a, a tiny bit more around the ableism. For all of us, you know, with this ingrained construct and idea yeah. of what we should be, how do we pull it apart? What, what is, do you have any kind of thoughts around how we need to shift that in a broader way? I'm the wrong person to ask. Okay. I have no answers, I just have problems. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I'm also a poet, so I'm useless. <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, because the thing is, people just say things without thinking. And you can't stop the entire world from suddenly just having 
an epiphany, every individual that you ever come in contact with having an, an internal epiphany, and then suddenly you're just going to walk through life and no one's ever going to say anything thoughtless and shitty to you. I mean, I don't see how we were ever going to get to that point. Or if the people in power are going to suddenly just be like, yes, let's make everything accessible and not care about money. <laughs> so we've got to burn it all down and start again. That's the other title. That's the subtitle of your book. <laughs> um, you mentioned um, before growing up in regional Australia, and I know that's a really... A, we've, and there's a couple of stories in this book that cover the significance of um, regional Australia as growing up disabled. Yeah. For you, what was it? What was key about it? How did it impact you? Oh, my God. It was so lonely, you guys. It was so lonely and weird but also hilarious because my mum and dad are also pretty funny, and even when they're not trying to be. So, like, that was always really fun. Um, and, I mean, you haven't lived until you're raised in the middle of nowhere and had this religion that is from America of all places. And let's be fair, it's a religion that really only works if you're wealthy. I guess that's all religions, though, not just Mormons. But you're that, and you're in the middle of nowhere, so you've got no point of reference. And it's just lonely and weird and funny. And I could write a book about it, I'm pretty sure. But I mean, that's what Mormon Girl was kind of trying to show. So when I, did, when I wrote Mormon Girl, it was about growing up and with my disabilities and stuff, but also finding out some pretty, <laughs> what I didn't realize until working on it was quite traumatic stuff which I'm afraid you will have to go and see the show or something whenever it's on um, to find out what that stuff is. But in that, I was able to be super funny and explore all these aspects of my disability that um, I was always so ashamed of that I wasn't able to filter it through humour until 20 years later. And I really feel like I just needed the time. And that's why this piece in the book is so good for me to have done, because I was able to filter it through time. And I mean, isn't that the whole comedy thing. It's like comedy is trauma with time. Because if you're going through the trauma and then doing a stand-up show about it, that's not going to work. You're just going to be crying and no one wants to see that. But once you've got it and you've been able to go through it and stuff, then you can turn it into something that's funny and something that can change lives or at least make people understand you a bit better. So I guess my whole reason for writing and performing in general is because I just want people to get me in a way that's outside of a medical setting. I want to be amazing because I'm funny, not amazing because I've had all this shit happen and I'm still funny. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like, it really I does. want to be brilliant, not just pity brilliant. I want proper brilliance. Yeah. <laughs> um, just one more quick question. When we were preparing for this, you said having read everybody else's, this is going back to where we started in our conversation. Yeah. You read everyone else's piece and you're like, wow, that is just beautifully, there's some vulnerability in this book that is um, stunning. Yeah. And you had said, bloody hell, why did I not do that? What, what, what would you, if you had your time again, what would you write now? Oh, I've changed my mind about that. Okay, well, don't, you should have told me before we got on stage. No, 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 this is good. This is, this is good. I changed my mind about it for these reasons, because I was thinking about that. And what I wrote in my little notebook was that the thing is that when I was writing about um, my spinal surgery, I did this piece for Mianjin called If Your Body Is Wrong, Say Hi. And in that, I wrote about having scoliosis and doing dance classes and having people say shitty things to me while I was trying to just do dance classes. Um, and so I did that. And then I wrote another piece called um, Oh, Rebel Girl, You Are the Queen of Something Deep Inside. And that was about being 13 and getting my spinal surgery. Also, if you haven't already figured out, both of the titles of those are from songs I like. Basically, I just want to talk about music most of the time. I don't want to have... Can we just make everything accessible and cool for everyone so that we can talk about the fun stuff? Yeah. That would be freaking awesome. Just think about that able bodies like you know <laughs> we've all got interests and things that we're passionate about so if people were less dicky we'd be able to talk about that <laughs> and that's the line on the back if people yeah. were less dicky we could talk about the fun stuff um, but um yeah so I wrote about that stuff and that's how I came 
to want to write about the eye stuff because that's something that I haven't really before. Right. And I thought it would be a thing that I could do. And it was also something I knew I could make funny because when you've got bad eyesight and you're trying to cover it up, things happen. And they're very humorous. Do you know how many ugly boys I kissed when I went out <laughs> without wearing my glasses? So many. <laughs> so many. Anyway. <laughs> so well, yeah, I wear my glasses now. We'll continue um, having this conversation with you when we, um, when we join together uh, it, at the end well, after we've heard everybody. Yeah. Astrid uh, joins us as well. Remember Astrid from down on the other side of the panel? Hi, Astrid. Hello, everyone. Um, would you actually like to, to kind of locate us and read to us from who counts as disabled anyway? I would. So I have multiple sclerosis and I don't look sick. And that has caused me much confusion and it confuses others. And because I don't look sick, I actually started my piece listing all of the ways that my body can go wrong. I'm not going to read that for you now because I would probably cry, um, but I am going to read you two paragraphs about my quest to find somebody that has multiple sclerosis that stays in the public eye. I've always wanted Joan Didion as my MS role model. But America's greatest living essayist wrote two paragraphs about her diagnosis in 1979's The White Album and has revealed almost nothing since, despite writing about the most intimate of topics, her grief over the deaths of her husband and her daughter. Didion has revealed her emotional pain to the world, but not her MS, and I wonder why. Many times, I've watched the video of Joan Didion receiving the 2012 National Medal of Arts from President Obama. Always diminutive. In this clip, she looks incredibly frail and small. After a military chaperone helps her to the stage, Obama has to prop her up. Is that age or is that MS? Is that what I will look like one day? And is that why I never see people who have had MS for a long time in public? Yes. Thank you. Your piece is really at the heart, you know, an identity. It's, a, it's looking at identity, but also identity as um, understood from outside of us, how we are included or, or not in spaces. And it's an interesting, really interesting piece because you talk about inclusion in the disability community. And I want to start with your very last line of your piece, which is, do I belong in this anthology? You wrote that piece a couple of years ago. Do you, how have you reflected on that now that you've, you, you're in, we've, you've read the other pieces, you've understood yourself in this space now two years beyond? What, what would you say now? I do belong in the anthology, but sometimes people still question that and they question if I have a disability. And to that I would say, you take a look at my MRIs and, my God, you will cry and cut them up like I did. Um, you know, it's the idea that you have to have a visible disability is insulting. But also, to anybody with MS or a neurological condition or any other condition or disease or impairment, you don't have to identify the way I have chosen to identify. It is a choice. Um, I already feel like I'm rambling, Jacinta. No, um, my God. But I guess I wrote this piece, you know, quite a while ago now, as we all did. You know, we submitted, I think, at the end of 2019. And I would write bits of it differently now. Um, my multiple sclerosis is degenerative and progressive, so, you know, it's a little bit further along than it was back then. Um, I'm a little bit older. I think I'm a little bit more confident. But I live in a body that continually betrays me, looks fine, but it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And I am still learning, and every day I am learning what I do with it. Yeah. You write um, in the, your piece something that's very close to my heart, and I know a lot of people, um, I don't look sick, but I am uh, not looking sick is a problem. 
Um, having a, an invisible illness, as you've just talked about there, is so central to your experience, but so is the changing nature of it, as you say. There is nothing static and absolute about where you are, and you're constantly navigating that and navigating it with the world outside of you. Tell us about that. I have an invisible disability. Uh, I also have a great deal of privilege. I am a white woman. I am a very well-educated white woman, and I am cisgender and hetero. I don't have... I don't experience a lot of the barriers that society puts up. Uh, I ran smack bang into uh, what society does to people who are considered ill or have disabilities in my early 30s. As I write in the piece, um, not in much detail, but I spent a couple of years uh, unemployed, underemployed, and working for free, uh, despite formerly being a very well-paid consultant, um, because people didn't want to hire someone uh, that's a sickly risk, like uh, is perceived as multiple sclerosis. I would argue that that is not the case, but there is a perception there, and that is the barriers that exist. I find not looking sick a problem for some really obvious reasons. Um, it's hard when I am in public and I suddenly feel quite ill. I, um, Jeanette Finlay and Kylie Finlay are here, and I fought my way into a cab and tried to steal, steal their cab one day because I thought I was going to faint with heat stroke. I have no heat tolerance. <laughs> you know, the temperature changes, I will go down, I knew it was going to happen, was fighting to get home, tried to steal Kylie and her mum's cab. <laughs> uh, didn't realise till I was in the cab that's how desperate I was. Um, so, you know, like, that's a kind of a funny example looking back, but it's hard not to look ill when you are speaking to your very highly qualified neurologist who is like, but does it really hurt? Like, do you really feel that? I'm like, do we need to go into an MRI machine and have a look at how bad this has got? You know, um, it's... I have a very supportive family, but sometimes... It's hard to remind someone every single day that I might be able to do it today and I might not. Um, my dad is a wonderfully supportive dad and he actually got angry at me uh, when I was... I got stuck in Sydney and I was stuck in lockdown with my parents um, uh, over the border. But he got angry at me because I couldn't go for a walk with him because I look like I can go for a walk. But if I went for a walk, I would then have had to spend the next day in bed. So I didn't want to go for that walk. And he's like, no, no, you have to come. I'm like, Dad, progressive neurological condition. Like, go away. Like, you don't get to ask me this anymore. And, you know, I, I want to acknowledge my privilege again, but I also want to express the pain and the misunderstanding that can happen in relationships when you, when the people that you love forget that they're not, that you are maybe not the way they want you to be on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hearing you. Astrid, as well as that external world and that changing flux, of course, your body is your relationship with that. You write in your piece, more often you feel like a stranger to your own flesh. Yeah. I, you know, uh, in the first year after my di diagnosis, I was really ill. Um, and all over the place emotionally as I tried to sort myself out. And, you know, I used to hold my arm and scratch myself until I bled because I couldn't feel the skin or the muscles. And I've learnt to stop myself doing that now. But, you know, I'll wake up in the morning and do a check. What can I feel? What can I not feel today? You know, I'll be out. And as I write in the piece, I was at work one day and couldn't move my arm. Just, you know, looks fine, but I no longer had any... It wasn't doing anything that it should, um, that I would like it to do. Uh, and so I didn't know what to do, so I just put my jacket on and put my hand, my arm, in my pocket. I don't know. I mean, I wasn't going to lose it, but I also just couldn't have it hanging there either. Like, I mean, I, I don't know how I'm explaining this very well. This is kind of embarrassing now that people are looking at me, but, like... No, <laughs> I, I, you know I understand what? exactly <laughs> what you're saying. And you know? to say that that's such a clear explanation of that experience. It's like, well, what do I do? I'm not going to lose it, which is <laughs> fascinating, you know, I've got to, but I've got to put it somewhere. Yeah. So, you know, I, um, I'm continually learning about being stuck uh, as me, actually. Yeah. 
Um, behind the scenes as well, we'll see what happened when I, when, if you've changed too. You said um, <laughs> when you were talking about uh, your piece and you were, you were processing it and you were writing it, you actually had a couple of different titles for it. And this, this is an interesting kind of intersection as well, isn't it? Um, what were you going to call it? Uh, I was going to call it Am I Disabled Enough For You? I was also going to... Um, uh, do I belong in, the, in this anthology? Um, and, you know, I was very angry the first time I wrote this piece. I was angry because I felt sick, so I was just a bit angry. But I was also angry that, that as I do write in the piece, I have always felt welcome in the MS community. That is a community that I obviously um, have a pass in for the rest of my life. But I have not always felt welcome in the disability community, and I feel like I'm going to get attacked on Twitter for saying that, but it's true. Um, and I have such a great respect for the Growing Up series. There have been several in the um, series before, Growing Up African, Growing Up Aboriginal, uh, Growing Up Queer, Growing Up Asian, and I respect all of the writers in there, and I was just petrified and angry that somebody with a chronic illness wouldn't, a lifelong chronic illness wouldn't be represented. That was a long-winded answer I just gave no, you. No, no, I think it's so, it's such an important part of this and a really brave thing to talk about is that idea of inclusion and belonging. And also the anger, uh, you know, I think we're all nodding around right. the and anger. Powerful. Yeah, that, that sense of how much anger is part of the experience. When we speak. Yeah. yeah. It's coming out of you, to the truth. That's right, isn't it, Jane? Yep, it is. It's very strong. Yeah. Do we have Jane's mic? Sort of somewhere there. Testing, testing, one, two, three. There she is. <laughs> You're there. <laughs> it might be a really wonderful time, Jane, for us to uh, welcome you into this conversation as well. Um, and in a moment, I'd you know, love for us just to talk. Would you like um, me to say the welcome first? I would love you to say the welcome, please. Yeah? yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi everybody, my name's Jane and I'd like to begin by paying my respects to the Wondery people, to the traditional custodies of this land, where we are meeting upon today for its elders and past and presence, and even for the self agency people who have passed away and who are still here today on Aboriginal land. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. We feel so lucky to have you uh, join us today, Jane Rosen. I know, she's Auntie Jane. Auntie Jane. <laughs> Auntie Jane Rosengrave, the book, uh, this piece that you wrote, and you wrote it in um, conjunction with Carly Finlay called Free as a Bird. Yeah. Um, potentially in this conversation, you have touched on some really brave and personal experiences in your life, sexual violence and violence. Yeah. So this is possibly the time that that might come up in our conversation, if you'd like to know that. Um, I want to know... How hard, when you first told your story, because this, this is, you've told this is now another time that you've told it, but the first time that you found your voice, and we're just talking about the strength of that, Jane, how hard was it? I'll tell you, the very first time I was still living with um, Dickhead, I'm sorry, but the very first time I started telling my story was at the Royal Commission, when I was with Ch Ryan Charles Thomas, in, and I was living in Cranbourne, and um, it was out of Mitre, and um, Pauline wrote, saw this article in the newspaper about wanting more people from institutions to come forward and tell their stories at the Ryan Charles Thomas. And Pauline explained it all to me, and I said, Pauline, they won't believe me. They'll think I'm making it up. They'll think. And after that, Pauline goes, well, give it a go. I go, now I was crying as, and that as well in the office because I've, um, it was the first time probably since I've left the jail, but I have told other people, but not all of it. And um, that's when Pauline said, I'll ring them up and I'll let them talk to you. So, I, so Pauline rang them up and they had a talk to me. Pauline explained who I was and all that. And then Pauline, um, I started talking to him and I said, um, my name's Jane, um, I was brought up in institutions from the age of 
six months old, but I was even under six months old in the land in Trana. And from six months old, I was in Nazareth House Boys Home, Sebastopol, um, and in Ballarat. And then I was transferred from five to 21 to a bigger institution, which was called Pleasant Creek Training Centre, which was not so pleasant because there was a lot of things that happened behind closed doors there. And we had to have, shut our mouths and not say a thing about it. We had to because we weren't being believed in those days. Um, like I can remember from the orphanage, I'll say a few things from the orphanage I will, and that, that when I was in the orphanage, I can remember from three, under three, I can't remember things, but from three years old, I can. And I can remember with the priest, Father Smith, he was at the, at the orphanage there in Ballarat, and he used to get yummy food. We used to get the horrible food we did as kids. Sometimes I used to go and climb through his window, and I used to steal his food, and I got caught, and I got in trouble for it. I did. Because he used to get eggs and bacon, we used to get the horrible food. And then after that, um, I can remember the swimming pool as well there, that in the um, orphanage, that I was only three, and when the nuns used to say, right, everybody out of the swimming pool? And they, I used to always be the last one out of the swimming pool, but I had to be up the deep end of the swimming pool. And I tried to get out, and I couldn't, but they ducked me all the time, because I was always the last one. From the, out of, to get out of the swimming pool. That's why. And I can remember the trams that when, when they were there that used to go to um, the orphanage as well. And I used to always be the last one to eat my food as well. And we used to have beds in rows. And there was only that much space for the nuns to walk side on to fill the beds. And whoever's with the bed had to go back into the bed, lie there until the nuns um, being all in the wards, filling the beds, and the ones who hadn't wet the bed were allowed to go and get breakfast, but the ones who had wet the bed had to stay and lie in bed, and then the nuns would get the sheet, put them over our head with big safety pins, and we had to smell our own urine and, and shit, I'm sorry, but shit too, um, for an hour or so. And we missed out on breakfast as well then. And I, I can remember there was, I stayed there from when I was five, and then when there was a vacancy that came up, because there was Jane Field, Arrowdale, Kew Cottages, Pleasant Creek, um, Clander in Colac, and when there was ever a, um, a vacancy, in any of those institutions, that's where you would go. And I ended up going to Pleasant Creek Training Centre, which was not so pleasant when I was five years old. And um, my mum wouldn't let, let people adopt me out, which people wanted to adopt me out because I was so spoiled and that when I was young, that my mum did not want that. My mum wanted me to stay in the home and grow up there. But she passed away and I didn't know that I had a mother until I was eight. Before I was eight, I thought the institution was my family. And I thought all those children were my brothers and sisters and the nurses were my mum and dad. But when I, when I turned eight, the nurses said, I've got information for you, Jane. Do you know your mum's dead? I didn't know I had family before that. And that's when I um, wouldn't have been straight away, but I would say like I was... Um, Eight, not when they told me, it would have been probably about ten, I started wanting to find my family on who they are. And I started doing it, kept on doing it, even after I left school. And it and took you a while, Jane, didn't it, to find out that you had Indigenous? Um, well, I had a feeling, had I a feeling. did, yeah. in the institution, because I used to hang around the Aboriginals. And in those days, you weren't allowed to say if you were Aboriginal, in those days. Yeah. Because um, way back in those days, it was against the law and that. But now it's different. You know, it's all changed now. But I used to go real, real, real dark brown. I did. And I was even on the, um, what do you call it, those tablets? You know, those pills when you're in an institution so you won't get pregnant? I used to be on those too, all our senior girls, and that used to make me really go dark brown and that. 
because um, like there was Linda Davies who was Indigenous, Ray Kirby, Indigenous, Ralph Kerr, Indigenous, Sharon Mayborn, Indigenous, Darren Mayborn, Indigenous, Danny McGeary. You know, there was quite a lot, yeah. but there was people there who weren't Aboriginal as well. And with this really extensive years and years of such a difficult childhood abuse... Yes, you, sexual you write, abuse. ..that you write about in this story... Yeah. ..when you finally did tell your story to the Royal Commission, Jane, what was that like? I actually felt if I was being believed. Yeah. I felt like if um, things were starting to change. I felt like if um, my story was starting to get out there and I found out even when I was telling my story to the Royal Commission and to Ryan Charles Thomas that the, the people who did it before me were even sexually abused by the same staff members that I was sexually abused by. Mr Brain at six years old, sexually abused at Marlborough House, which was a government place for children from all institutions that never had holidays to go to. So they used to have a break and have two weeks at Marlborough House and there was um, about 50 or 70 kids and then there used to be 10 staff and it was one of those staff members that sexually abused me at the age of six years old because after that, when I came back from Portsy, back to the jail, I'll call it, um, and I was only six years old, a month later, I went up to the boys' ward and I played around with the boys and I got into serious trouble for it. And it was, I reckon it was that trigger on when I was sexually abused at Marlborough House. Yeah. That that's what happened. And then I was, even in senior girls, when I was 13 years old, um, I was even sexually abused again by another staff member down the front office on a weekend when all the wards went swimming and our staff member would not let us go swimming. So I said to the senior girls, do you dare me to go down to that front office to get us to go swimming? They go, we dare. So I went down to the front office. I told the, big doc, the big boss, who's in charge of all the wards, and I said, our ward's not going swimming. All the other wards have gone swimming and we want to go swimming. He goes, I want you to do me a big favour first. I'll close this front door and you get into that room and pull your pants down and wait yeah. for me. So that's what I had to do. And um, then he... Oh, yeah, sorry, oh, no. Oh, shit, sorry. No, oh. not at all. Not, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I was hearing something, that's all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fine, yeah. And then after that... Um, after that, he pulled his pants down and I had to, um, you know what, and he got the hanky ready and it came and then he said, don't you ever tell anybody or you'll not go swimming again on a, f on a weekend. So I didn't. I kept it to myself. And it, then the next one was six, 16 years old. Yeah. When I, was raped in the when I was raped in the back of a bus. That went on for three years from the bus driver who used to take us to church and he got attached to me and he asked his family if, it, if they would like someone from Pleasant Creek to go out in the community. They said yes. So they had to get permission from the front office and in those days they didn't do police records and all this. They didn't and they didn't even go to... They went to the person's house but just to make sure they weren't drinking or smoking, that was all. No checks and no safety and no protection That's for right. you yeah. that time. And then that went, on, that went on for three years in the back of a bus, yeah. 16, 17 and 18. And then it even happened at the milk bar down under the alley. When on a Friday night, when the staff used, not the staff, when, the, um, when I was working at the milk bar and the family used to first go, go home about, because it, it was from six to nine, Yeah, it was on a Friday night, because yeah. the shops were open late. And it was about oh, 8.30 that the family used to go home and it was only him and I there. And that's where it happened again. Jane, your incredible courage and your strength to share this story has given so many other people um, strength as yes. well. 
because you only live once on the earth. And I, I'm a strong self advocacy. I went and joined Rainforce, yeah. which is for people with an intellectual disability. And they've been going since 1980 on demanding the government to close all these institutions down and to have self advocacy people with a disability and an intellectual disability to have a voice to be heard. Um, and which they did. And they even used to go to DHS and lock themselves at DHS to tell the government to listen to us. And it is just such a, an incredible thing that we hear your voice tonight and we can read your voice in this book. And what I, um, I, have, like, I, I love sitting here with you and the beautiful uh, energy that you have, Jane. Your book is called Free as a Bird. And you only live once on this earth. Yeah. And Why Free as a Bird? Oh, can I do that? I'd love you to. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Jane's got something for us. I'd love to do my actions on me being as free as a bird, which is going to be for the rest of my life, and you only live once. I'm just going to move that out of the so way. So I walk around, and I will do the actions on free as a bird. And that. Thank you very much, Aww. everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Your sparkling eyes, we could know. Well, I've got my dad's eyes, my, Les. They're beauty. Yeah, I've got his eyes, yeah. and I reckon that's why I'm strong. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm interested, for us all, I'm interested for us all to talk to each other for a little bit. And in a moment, not very far away, in fact, we're going to invite you to ask questions. So think about them. And if you're online somewhere out there in the virtual world, we're also um, very much encouraging you oh, to leave any questions in the chat box so that we can, um, we can ask okay. our panellists anything with great and deep loving respect for each other. <laughs> I want to know, um, having read the book, which we talked about, just we might as well start with you. Um, and any, I, I want to ask you all this. How did you feel the experience of reading? And you mentioned before this kinship, Jess, that you felt in reading. Was there a story that really resonated for you? Um, there was a few. Um, I really liked, well, I mean, you, you flattered me by saying that mine was funny, but the ones that I think are super funny um, is the Alastair Baldwin one, um, which is just so hilarious. I'm so jealous. I wish I'd written that one. Um, but um, that's really good. But I also really loved this one. I've put little bookmarks in um, for the ones because I knew that this question was coming. Um, it's by Blurred Lines by Iman Shanu. Um, I hope that I've um, said that correctly. But that is about a person who is vision impaired and also Muslim. And I loved the intersection of religion and disability in that one because it was, you know, I felt quite a kinship with her, even though my experience is like very different. Um, because Mormons have not been vilified the way that the Muslim religion has been. Um, we're allowed to do whatever we want and no one, no one gives a crap. Uh, but so I really, I actually did really love that, especially because, yeah, she also shares about how people in the family can say, you know, things that they're not, they don't think first, but it's hurtful. Um, so, you know, someone told her she was too beautiful to use a cane and it's like, Eh, those kind of double-edged compliments don't really do us any good <laughs> like, um, at all. Uh, so I really loved that one. The Alastair Baldwin one was really good. Also, oh, Jane, I, I put a bookmark in on yours. <laughs> Jane's was brilliant. Um, I think the thing that I, I loved about the book was that there were so many, so many different stories and it really blew up the idea that mm. disability is a monolith or we're all the same and I think that that's what I took away from it and what I liked the most is that we're all our, all of our experiences are so rich and varied and nuanced that you can't really pinpoint a a thing that we're all we're all the same but in saying that there are similarities and I think that's yeah. the kind of thing that we need to like focus more on like also for example like Astrid I'm so sad you haven't felt welcome um, that you know because you know people might mm -hmm. not think that but you can't you can't fight a feeling if you don't feel welcome somewhere it freaking sucks mm -hmm. so 
you know, and we all know how that feels. So I feel that that's something that we should maybe concentrate on in communities because communities can have trouble like being cohesive and stuff because people are people, no matter what you're doing. Um, so I think the thing that I loved about this is that there were common threads about humanity and struggle and similar things like that. And I feel like it's just the perfect thing for us to focus on, don't you think? Like the similarities in the community and the things that we are fighting for will benefit all of us. Absolutely. And right. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so, but the thing is, in saying that I felt a kinship, I will say, I don't know if anyone else felt this way about reading the book, but I did actually feel also a little bit, I hate using the word triggered, but I felt triggered because I felt so much sympathy for everyone in this book, like even the funny ones and stuff. And it's just like, shit, you know, people should care more. Mm. There's a lot of weight in this book, isn't there? Yeah, There's yeah. There's a lot in I this. I actually had a bit of a cry afterwards because it just, it made me, this book made me actually think, and that's about the vulnerable thing that I said I changed my mind about and I was sorry about that. No, but that's it fine. It was like, but that was what, um, what hit me and what made me think that, oh, I, I hid behind my humour again. Why? But I also think that maybe the book needs the humour as well because yeah. it all needs to work together. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can feel bad and feel angry and, you know, and like, I want to smash things up and make things better. But I think laughter is also a pretty important aspect of, like, any um, activism. It's like a best struggle. medicine. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I do like it. And in saying that growing up in the country and religion was a bit shitty, it was. But I do feel that my parents' ability to laugh in the face of adversity is probably the best gift that they've given me. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> What about you? What were some of the pieces that really stood out? I was so looking forward to getting a copy. And my copy arrived, and I'm pretty sure I took a photo of it and put it on Instagram. <laughs> and then I got really scared because I was worried that I would just cry the whole time. Um, and I did cry in parts, uh, and I've now read the whole thing, but I also just keep opening it and reading another piece. I, I am so proud to be in this anthology and I can see you sitting there Kylie. Thank you for reading my piece and for, well including me, but for helping this one come together. I um, am not really a teary kind of person, but I can feel a tear kind of coming to my if eyes. If you start, so I'll kind start. Of <laughs> I'm kind of going to fail a bit, but just what you said before about kinship, I think that is, the, that is a really, that is the right word, the word that I'm kind of groping here for. My experience is very different than many people in this anthology, but I also feel like we share many barriers and experiences with the medical system and experiences with society. And I also would like to thank Black Ink. And I don't have to do that. No one asked me to. But I actually really am so glad that there is a publisher in Australia who is putting money towards this kind of nonfiction. Um, so thank you, everyone. And, and showing that reprint, the fact that this has been so successful, yeah. Yeah. there is an absolutely huge absolutely. audience um, and community yep. that wants to read these stories. Let's yeah. get it to a third reprint. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. Jane, I want to ask you, what do you hope that people will get from reading your piece and, and hearing your story? Um, I actually hope that with people, with, with my story being in the book, that the ones who have not added their story and the ones who are willing to add their story I'm hoping that they'll learn about my book, that they are to be believed. Yeah. They are. And that they, their word will get across. And even for these Indigenous people too, as well, and even for the stolen generation as well, that I'm, ho if, you know, I'm hoping that they will come forward and tell their stories about their childhood from when they were taken off their from when they were taken off their family and put into these um what are they called they aren't institutions but um in the outback um 
stations, no. communities, what? or yeah, but whatever they're called, you know, where the Aboriginals used to, yeah, I can't think what it's called. A mission. A mission. Yeah, missions. Missions. That's it. The missions. Okay. Yes. And when they used to be put into these missions with nuns and all that, but there was even Aboriginals that were dumped in institutions as well, like where I was and that. And I used to be called monkey a lot by the nuns because of that. And now I know why. But um, I'm really hoping that even people who are not Aboriginal and people who've got an intellectual disability or different types of disability, that I'm hoping that they'll go to the Royal Commission and tell their stories about their abuse, you know, physical abuse, traumatised, even domestic violence, which I've been through as well. We need a lot more women out there to come forward and tell their stories of domestic violence. Because you've got to remember, you only live once on this earth. You're under the ground a lot longer than what you are alive. And if you want your story out there for people to see, come forward. Aww. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think it would be lovely if we open up questions to all your masked faces this evening. Uh, if you've got a question, raise your hand. We don't have a microphone, so I'm going to have to repeat it so that anybody at home on the stream will hear the question. I've got one million more, so don't feel any pressure. But, you know, question time. Has anyone got one that they would like to um, present to the panel tonight? So... We won't uh -huh. bite you. Hi. <laughs> I have a question though. Mine's a comment. Yes. Um, that the word normal is not often not used with disability. They're apparently very different. And I just wanted to thank, similar to what Ashford said, Blanky, Blanky, all the writers, Carly, for making me feel normal. Uh, for anyone at home, uh, an audience member just uh, reiterating Astrid's words there in thanking Black Ink Publisher for normalising and making uh, the experience of disability and chronic illness normal and You're using welcome. that word uh, to apply to it here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're a good organisation, Black Ink, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Tonight, anything occur to you while we were having a chat? Don't be shy. All quiet. They're nice and quiet, aren't they? <laughs> you hear, you hear a pin drop. I have drop. a question. Can yeah. I ask you a question, Jacinta? Whoa! Oh, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Jacinta has written a book about her own experience of chronic illness, and I guess you are one of the people and people like you that I was hoping would, you know, pick up this anthology and read it. What was your experience like as a person with illness to read our stories? Uh, profound and beautiful and all the words I described at the start. I think what I find always phenomenal is the connectivity because of, again, I think that social model that we brought up earlier on um, that we face the experiences of living in a world that doesn't have space for diversity and, and difference and disability and all the things that we experience with our stuff. And I just felt really connected and heard and seen. And sometimes I was like, that feels like exactly how I would say it, <laughs> which is quite phenomenal. It, it, looking across the spectrum of the experience, it felt um, incredible to be reading your words, but applied to a very different thing. And I think what you were saying, Jess, really resonated with me around that, the power of that connection. Did you say that too, Astrid, that, that connection that we have with each other is a, a strong Jess's one? Word, yeah, kinship. Jess, <laughs> the kinship. The, and also the, the fact that this sort of writing, I think, does such an incredible job in showing this beautiful nuance and, and micro experience in such a, an incredible way, but also um, yeah, it, it binds us together in a really powerful way. I think it's just exceptional. This will, as you say, Carly Finlay, it has and it will change lives. And it made me feel like I belonged yeah. to somewhere. Do you think I could use a quote from Anne of Green Gables using a term <laughs> that I didn't 
course you can. <laughs> and, and say that I feel like this book is going to go out into the world and it's going to make us feel like we're all bosom friends with a bunch of strangers. Mm, yep. What do you think, I mean, I'm really interested in that, um, about what, what you believe, I mean, the impact of sharing this writing is and the obvious and apparent need for diverse experiences of this world to be shared far more, um, far more widely. You, Jess, your thoughts? Uh, can you repeat the, that? Yeah, that was a ramble. But my <laughs> question was, what do you think the impact of this book will be? Oh, um, I think the impact has been shown quite excitedly with the fact that it's in a second printing. I think that's a really good sign. Um, and so, I don't know, I mean, I'm just going to be super selfish and say I hope that the impact of this book is a bunch of people are going to read my writing and think I'm brilliant, hilarious, and ring me up and be like, can you write more things for us? And I'll be like, why, yes, I can. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, I hope that this changes my life. <laughs> yeah, that is an excellent answer. It is. It is. <laughs> Ashton, what about you? What do you think? Uh, my answer is not that good. Um, I teach. I teach writing. And I have, I am surrounded by very good writers and students of all ages who want to tell their story. And I want them to know that people care and that people will buy it and people will read it. And I want stories to matter. And I think that this book is going to stay in print for a very long time. Yeah. And that is yeah. very, very good. Mm. Yeah. Jane? Um, I'm, I'm happy. Um, thanks, um, Carly. Carly, for accepting <laughs> me into the book and that which I'm very happy about. And with the book, I'm really happy about that we've done the book on people's different stories, on different um, things, what they've been through in their life. I'm hoping that the book will keep going and I was just thinking of um, a few things like it would be good for that book to go out in the outback yeah. as well for the um, Aboriginals because they might come forward and tell, want to tell their stories, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, that, and even overseas as well, it would be a good idea to have it to go overseas as well. For people over there, if they want to tell their stories from over there, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. And I, I, sometimes pictures tell the story. The ones who can't say or who have lost, you know, what do you call them? Those people who can't speak and that. And if they want to tell their stories, they can tell their stories by pictures or that. Because, you know, I do painting. I do. I've got to do painting. But pictures can tell stories more than words Yeah. as well. True. Yeah, it's fantastic. I'm going to ask you a Carly, question. Carly, hi. Facetious question. Facetious answers only. Yes, my favourite. <laughs> okay, just to let you know at home, Carly Finlay is asking a facetious question and requesting a facetious answer in response. What does that mean, facetious? Smart ass. Oh, smart ass. Oh. <laughs> 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 Okay, so Carly is asking, as now I understand, a very smart ass question. Uh, because uh, Carly has faced a lot of. I've got my answer ready. But Carly's faced a lot of questions um, in the mainstream media around the use of the word disability. And why was the word disability used in the title? And why wasn't it differently abled or special or all the other words that we could use as euphemisms for disability? Uh, so Carly's interested in your response to that response. But not serious. No, not serious. Okay. Fun, in other so words. So the question was, uh, what was the question again? Sorry. Why isn't the book called Growing Up Differently yeah. Able in oh. Australia? <clears throat> okay. Um, well, speaker, I will cordially answer <laughs> by saying, if that book was titled In That Manner, I would take the copies, burn them in a huge fire, and dance around <laughs> naked in the fucking moonlight. <laughs> I kind of wish it was so that we could have seen that happen. I've seen similar titled books, so perhaps... I would yeah, love okay. that. We can find something. Uh, Astrid, what was your, what's your reaction to that? Um, I feel 
put on the spot and remarkably unfunny, and I. Um, <laughs> you can answer it serious if you have to. You can. Huh? Oh God! No, then I'm the serious I feel like person. I, I, I feel serious about it, Carly, because <laughs> I think that the question has really got so much in it around the use of the word disability. I was serious, yeah. everyone. Yeah. That was not. Yeah. A <laughs> <laughs> it's. I'm going to get Nathan and burn stuff. Those yeah. those questions, you know, why use the word disability? Why use the word word disabled? Because. Those words have been reclaimed. Those words matter. There is a source of pride in being disabled. There is a source of pride in having disabilities. And there is no shame. And stuff it to anyone who thinks that there is. Yeah. That's right. Jane? It reminds, it, it reminds me of the olden days, I'll say, way back in the um, 1970s and the 50s and the 40s and the 70s, you know, 80s and that, when they used to think that people who were put into institutions were retarded and spastic and mental case and all that. We used to get called all those names. But disabilities is like, if, like to me, I think disabilities is a good word one way because you aren't putting that person down. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh, exactly. Yeah. You, are, you are accepted into the community just like anybody else who has not got a disability and that, and they are accepting you. So it's that's what I... It's not a slur. It's not a slur. No. words are made to put you down. That's right. You in your place. Yeah. And it's like what the nuns called me monkey, yeah, which I don't nice. like that word at all. Yeah. Thanks, Shane. Um, I'm going to give you one more chance. <laughs> Speak now. Is there? Sweet. I've been refreshing it. Is there what? Hang on, there's a couple We're of questions, questions here. This is, I'm going oh, online. technical. Oh. Okay. Hang on, sorry. This is <laughs> for... <laughs> yeah, so it's not working. Oh, no. <laughs> so uh, we do have some questions. Yeah, do you want to... Everybody, oh, yep. big round of applause for the <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> Hi, Denise. Sorry, we've ignored you. Denise on Facebook wants to know if the NDIS has been part of any of the speakers' worlds. Would anyone like to speak to that? Yes. 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 Um, so I am 38, and I, because my family raised me with a can-do attitude, I was raised to believe if I just tried my best, I would be able to get a job and be a good member of society. So I spent my 20s and everything working very hard um, trying to get a job and it just it did not work. And I now know that that was because of my eyesight. But because no one in my family ever used the word disabled and because I was always made to feel like that was a word to be scared of and ashamed of, I just kept thinking that it was just my inability to, I don't know, work hard or anything. And I'm talking about I can't see, I have inoperable cataracts and no peripheral vision. So do you think it's any surprise I didn't last more than a day in a kitchen of a restaurant? Yeah, exactly. Or working in a cafe or something. People just think you're lazy when it was just that I, could, I, I couldn't see. And even with teaching, that was a little bit better. But again, primary school and everything like that, you can't really teach sport very well when you can't see anything. Mm. <laughs> It's also really boring when you can't see the ball. So boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's also boring when you can see. I oh, know. Thank you. That was going to be my. That was going to be my little sports zinger. I was like, sports boring anyway. I don't care. But, um, so I didn't actually do the disability applying for disability thing till I was about thirty, and I got rejected the first time, and then I started getting into the disability community. And I made friends with some people and they're like, why are you not on it? You, you know, and not in like, and not in a bad way, like, you're so shit, why aren't you on disability? It was more like, you need help. And it sucks that you're spending all your time trying to fit into this world that's clearly not accepting you. You should apply for disability based on your eyesight. Because I tried doing it when I had kidney disease and I was waiting for my kidney transplant. Um, but because I tried to do that a few times, every time I tried to do that with NDIS and stuff and Centrelink, they were like, yeah, but you're going to get a kidney eventually, so we can't help you. 
Um, mm. So it wasn't until I did the eye thing for the third time with friends from with a friend with a disability who knew how to fill out the form. This is such a huge thing. If you are trying yeah. to get disability, the paperwork has a secret code and mm. no one has that code. So the only reason I did eventually get it was I got to the part where you have to go see a doctor. And the thing is, my eyes are so fucked, I can't fake it, right? So they looked at my eyesight, looked at me, and they're like, this is pretty bad. You are going to need some financial assistance. And that was when I got it, and it changed my life. Uh -huh. Because I was no longer trying to work and stuff. I was able to be like, oh, I guess I can try the writing thing I've always wanted to from now on. And it was actually getting the NDIS that allowed me to focus less on trying to freaking survive and be dehumanized and actually be able to write and stuff. And that's how Carly found me and that's how other people found me. It was through the writing and the time to write, thankfully because of being on the NDIS. Anyone else want to reflect on the NDIS? I'm on the NDIS, but at the moment, because you know this virus, um, I'm not letting people in my place at the moment because, um, you know, like, it's very catchy, I reckon. And there's a few people that have done the same thing as I have. Until yeah. we, until I've had the injection and that, that's when I'll let people come in mm. and um, help me with my cooking and, you know, all that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Astrid, any thoughts? Uh, I uh, am not on the NDIS because um, uh, one of the MS organisations brokered the, the first kind of um, uh, appointment and I burst into tears and the meeting didn't go very well. And that was a few years ago and I haven't found the mental fortitude to try again. I can help you if you want or maybe give you some support. One day, I, 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 it is on my to-do list, mm. one day. Um, I've got one more question, but I lost the... Um, no, you can share, just get your Kate's face, but I do know it's from Annabelle on Facebook, and it is around the reception of ableist concepts. Mm -hmm. The use of words like bravery and inspiration. What does bravery mean? Bravery, so when people oh, brave, say, oh, you're so brave... brave. And, I you thought you said bravery. No. <laughs> <laughs> or inspiration, I think, is being such yeah. a, you know, you're an inspiration before just, you know, being funny. Being Jess? told brave, you're brave is okay. It's the tone. It's the frickin' tone that people <laughs> use when they say things like you're brave or you're an inspiration. They think they're being nice, but they're being condescending and I freaking hate it. There is nothing that makes me want to burn things more than a well-intentioned person. So I've got is there something in my head? Gone now. Gone. <laughs> was it a bug? Oh my it God, was, was it a bug? It's a bug that's flown away. It was like a fly. It was not even like a fly. It was a fly. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but it's gone. I just noticed it when you noticed it. You can it. take the girl out of the farm, but you can't take the farm out of the girl. <laughs> How humiliating, everyone. No! <laughs> no. I like to. Um, so, yes. Uh, where was I? Oh, my God. You That's a bonfire. Them. Yes. The, nothing makes me want to burn things more than people patronising me. And I guess you can imagine that being small and stuff, I probably got a lot of that, like the patronising thing, being little, being infantilised. That's the thing. Disabled people have to deal with so much infantilization, and it's just... It's, it's sometimes it literally makes me just want to be like Grandpa Simpson, and just once they've done, just being like, I've had sex. <laughs> <laughs> so they know. Guess you're a dag. You know what a dag is? Hang on the back of a sheep's bum. I know. <laughs> Jane, do you, how do you receive it when people are saying things to you that make you feel, uh, you know, some of that stuff where it's like, oh, you know, you're so inspiring or... Well, one thing I like, because of my laugh, I've had it all my life, right? Um, some people say I laugh like a seal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Which I like it. I like it because I've yeah, always had right. my laugh. So there's but kindness in that. Say that again. There's kindness when they say that to you. Yeah, that yeah, like definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're when you're saying about the bonfires, yes. right? Love, love I can remember the bonfires that we had in the institution. 
Way back in the um, 70s, at the back, it was an oval, but there was a part there for the bonfires, and we used to go out up to oh, the so back. you did it too, you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And we used to have the bonfires, and then we used to have a fire truck, but sometimes we had our boyfriends. It was at night time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> and if we had our boyfriends, because the staff used to go up there, but we used to, because it was that big, the fire, yeah. we used to sneak around and, you know, around behind the truck, and, you know, <laughs> well, my bonfires were with my family. I didn't make out with anyone. No, but that, that was in those days. I feel like both of you have had way more fun than I have. Uh, I would say um, people with disabilities, disabled people aren't here for anybody else's amusement or making them feel better because they say, oh, aren't you brave today? Um, or their pity or whatever emotion they choose to put onto us. Um, when I suspect that, though, I behave really badly, I feel like it gives me a licence to say what I want. Yes, I am that's really, right. really <laughs> rude uh, when I am in my hospital gown because it's such a medicalised environment and I feel like this thing that is getting a sanitised version of pity um, you know, I wander around hospitals, you know, no underwear in my open back gown thinking, I can do whatever I want. No one is actually going to say anything because if they do, it's that feeling of, oh, you know, at least she's out of bed, she's walking, we can't say it. I don't know, I'm now rambling. Yeah. But it just The idea of someone looking at me and saying that I am brave or expressing pity makes me behave quite badly. And I find great strength in that. I don't know what that says about me, yeah. but... Yeah, um, yeah I, I feel that. From a, from a chronic illness perspective, like talking about hospital, um, I don't know like other people who have been in hospital like me, has anyone had the thing where you've kind of felt after a scary long hospital stay, or maybe Jacinta you might know about this, um, I know that my last one with my kidney uh, transplant and everything being very scary for a very long time, there were people like friends who were really supportive and would visit me all the time and they were all there all the time. But then when I got better, people disappear. Yeah. And it's like, you just liked the drama. Mm. Like, yeah. and it's a bit, it's a bit pissy. Like, it makes you think that they just wanted, this is, I'm not saying that this is their intention, but some, with some certain friends and stuff, you kind of feel like they are there because they like to feel important and needed. Yes. And it makes them feel good. And it's not actually maybe as much about you as you think. Mm. And then when you're better and stuff and you're not this pathetic, I was still funny, but I was also very sick, um, person, then they disappear and you don't see them and they don't check on you and there's no hanging out at all. And yeah. it, it's, um, it's, it's, it makes you feel all sad again. It makes you feel used. Yeah, exactly. Mm. It makes you feel used. So don't do that. Can I just say something? Of course you can, Jane. Um, the time, I don't know if anyone, probably is, some of you might have seen it, but while I think of it, if you want to watch my story, it's Jane's story on ABC Late Line, it is. And it was a couple of years ago when the, Royal, um, when the ABC asked me would I like to go back to the jail that I was brought up in and I had three people to come with me, Je um, Jess and, you know, there were some other people. And then I took heat, I, like there were some areas that I couldn't go down, I couldn't go there because it brought back the bad memories on me. So there was other people there that took photos of, of the jail and in the inside and the outside and all that. And when I got them developed, which it is true, it is really true, um, that I see ghost faces in the, some of these photos that I've got at home. The reason why, because it was, uh, those people that were sexually abusing the girls and there was even a school teacher that was taking the boys home at, at, on the weekends. So that's why there was these sad faces in this photo, in these photos of Pleasant Creek because um, there was girls there, including myself, that were sexually abused and there was even people there that were killed in the institution as well. And it was just not one institution, it was all institutions. 
Jane, I had an opportunity to see that, and I also encouraged Did you see you. it too? I had a look at it. Yeah. I watched it, and it's um, it's a it's an incredible piece, I have to say. So if you get an opportunity to, um, we've kind of come to the the end of our time together. Ooh. But is it the beginning of a friendship? <laughs> yes! So. Bosom friendship. Bosom friendship. <laughs> um, as we mentioned, there's um, some growing up disabled in Australia books down there in the corner. If you haven't had an opportunity to buy one, but if you've got yours, there's people here with pens that will sign them for you, including Carly being here. Um, an, incredible, uh, an incredible conversation. We could have done it for another 15 hours. Uh, please thank warmly Jane Rosengrave, Astrid Edwards, and Jess Knight for sharing with us not only in the book but tonight on stage. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you so much for joining us as well. Don't forget to subscribe to the Knowledge Melbourne channel to stay up to date with Melbourne Conversations events. There's also a link in the video description to a survey that the City of Melbourne team would love to hear your thoughts on the event. Buy and support disabled writers. Get online and support disabled um, social pages. And, um, you know, let's do this together. And it's really exciting. Congratulations to everybody involved in growing up disabled in Australia. Another round of applause. Carly. And did you want a photo? And, um, what are we going to do? Did you want a photo? Exactly. You remembered. If flip, you are flip, a contributor, flip. if you've been, uh, <laughs> if you were in, the, if you contributed to this book, <laughs> Carly would love it if you could come up now and we'll get a photo taken. Um, otherwise, we're just going to look amazing up here with um, the three contributors that yeah. we have. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Round of applause. Really, really wonderful. <laughs> Oh, now we're in the, in the dark. We're in the dark. Feel good? Thank you. I want to introduce you to someone. Oh, this is Christy, who did the teacher's notes in the book. That really went to school together. Oh, oh, what? St. Clair's, remember? St. Clair's! Yes. Far out. I only went there till grade four. Oh, well, I, like, I left in grade five. So. Were we in the same class? Yeah. Oh, far out. Oh, I'm of you. You look exactly the same. I don't. What's your name? Christine. Christine. Oh, Christine! Yes. Oh, my God! Yeah. We spend heaps of time yeah. together. We've been talking online. Yes. Oh my god, I didn't yes. recognise you. Of course, because I'm fully Because of that as well. No, and I'm fully grey now. So oh instead, <laughs> instead of actually oh, nice dark hair. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I'll tell you a book too because I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so good to yeah. see you. Yeah. So I was pretty excited to come here today because yeah. we can get out of the house and actually... I know, actually yeah. being in a group is yeah. cool, which is incredible. Do you want these? Yes. Do you know what? Oh, God, it hurts. Yeah, I know. Um, thank you very much.